Um, welcome to the second of the Tagore Distinguished Lectures, uh, which are being delivered this year by Dr. Swapan Dasgupta. Uh, some of you will have been at the first lecture yesterday. I'm sorry about the change of venue. That's only for today's lecture. Tomorrow, the third and final lecture will again take place in the River Room, where the first lecture was held. So uh, just to spare any confusion, if you come straight to the River Room tomorrow, uh, at, the, at the five o'clock time, it'll happen there. Um, but thank you all for, for being back here again this evening. Uh, those of you who were here yesterday will have heard a characteristically sharp and, and provocative and, and rich lecture uh, from Swapan in which he really was, as he put it, beginning to the story from the present and trying to sort of find a genealogy for some of the uh, principles, as he put it, of, of conservatism in India. And just as a kind of brief summary before we move into today's lecture, um, he, or at least an impressionistic account of what, what he was talking about yesterday, he, he, point, he, he drew out some of the, what he saw as the core principles of Indian conservatism, the idea that there's community wisdom, uh, 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 sort of Trump's individual choice in some ways, the attachment to the sacred, the importance of, of uh, a deep notion of religion, of the centrality of faith, uh, the sense that the state uh, must be somehow circumscribed by society, that, that, that the state can't engage in projects of cultural engineering, and the uh, close connection between conservatism and nationalism as well in India. Um, he also, I think, very interestingly drew out the importance of character in Indian conservative thought, and I might say in more generally in Indian thought from the late 19th century onwards, and this crucial notion of self-control, the control of the self and what that implies. So I think it sets up the, 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 the intellectual tools uh, uh, for a very interesting uh, second and third lecture. The, these next two lectures will be more political, uh, I believe, in their, in their focus. And the title of today's lecture is Indian Conservatism as a Protest Movement. Without further delay, Swapan, as you take a gulp of water, uh, the floor is yours. And... Uh, thank you, Sunil, for summarizing. You couldn't have done it better. I think you've addressed all the issues there. Uh, I'll start off from more or less where I ended yesterday with a two contrasts of the neurosis which greeted colonial rule in India. In Anandamat, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee's iconic novel, the, it concludes with the physician a physician who emerges from somewhere. I read it many, many years ago. I've forgotten some of the details. Goes to, to the Santandal, which is the army of Hindus who are fighting this battle, and says, it's time you abandoned your struggle. The British are here, and they will help us establish Sanatan Dharma. Against that, another person, Bhudev Mukherjee, who I referred to again yesterday, wrote a novel entitled Shopna Labdha Bharate Itihash, which means a history of India as revealed in its dreams. Now here, he engaged in what might be called counterfactual history. He envisaged a Maratha victory at the third battle of Panipat against Ahmad Shah Abdali. And the great might have been of history at that point. For him, that victory, imaginary victory, symbolized the emergence of a prosperous, united India under a wise Hindu emperor, the kingdom that combined enlightened Hindu virtues, the rule of dharma, with Western science and technology. Now, progress with a deep sense of rootedness and ethical virtues was at the heart of the post-independence dream of most Indian conservatives. 
some of whom were extremely distrustful of Gandhi's involvement of the masses in Indian, in national politics. For them, in fact, across the country, you find innumerable references to the glory of Japan. Japan was a great point of inspiration, a country which had re retained its cultural moorings and had, at the same time progressed significantly to the point where it had defeated an European power in 1905. So Japan struck them as being something worth emulating. Now, at the first roundtable conference in 1930, you know, it was one of those unsuccessful roundtable conferences. There were three. None of them yielded any uh, productive outcome. The Maharaja of Rewa, which is a small, tiny principality in Madhya Pradesh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Madhya Pradesh. Now, he, in one of the, in, in the proceedings, expressed surprise that in a country whose ways of life are so dominated by custom and tradition, there should be no political party which calls itself conservative. He, however, predicted that as British power eclipsed, a strong party of experienced and responsible politicians will emerge, which will call itself the conservative party. Now, like many of the Maharaja of Riva's dreams, that too was to re remain unfulfilled. Indeed, for the first four decades after independence, for the, for the perhaps the gloomiest period for the self-conscious self assertion of conservative politics. It was probably the blackest time when it almost got eclipsed. This is not to suggest that the non-political nationalism which I spoke of yesterday that embraced conservative inclinations were a complete non-starter when it came to getting your hands dirty in the field. Far from it. Viewed in terms of the pillars on which his political message rested, Mahatma Gandhi often seemed like that great deliverer Bhudev Mukherjee imagined would win the battle of Panipat and usher this great Sanatan Dharma, the rule, the great golden age, another new golden age for India. There were many facets of Gandhi which were immediately very, very appealing to the Indian conservatives who had been rooted in a slightly different tradition. There was, for instance, his celebration of the Indian village. It's not only a celebration, it was a deification of the Indian village. His celebration of the village community. His partiality for indigenous medicine, and I use indigenous medicine because indigenous medicine sometimes has been a great source of defining what constitutes tradi tradition versus what constitutes modernity in, in India. His imagery of Ram Raj appealed to a large body of in Indian conservatives who were looking for Hindu imageries because they had been brought up to believe that Hindu imagery constituted the most important point. And this Gandhi's appeal was particularly strong in middle India, which had not been exposed to the earlier traditions which actually emerged in the three presidencies, more the two presidencies, I would say, the Madras presidency was slightly different in character in, its, in the evolution of its intellectual thought. But certainly the Bombay and Bengal presidencies had been exposed considerably to that. So Gandhi appealed to the, another constituency, the small town, the provincial capitals. That was where, and it was there that he played a seminal role in nurturing the sense of national con uh, consciousness. But in the precedencies at the same time, Gandhi was viewed with a degree of suspicion and skepticism. 
This owed to various factors. I think the most important one, I would say, was Gandhi's stubborn refusal to accommodate modernity in the form of technology. Gandhi was anti-technology. He was distrustful of the railways, he was distrustful of medicine, he was distrustful of machines overall. He had a fanatical disavowal of anything to do with violence. And the imagery of violence had played a very important role in the earlier conservative traditions. And finally, his enthusiastic incorporation of the masses into politics. Now, take, for example, someone like Subhash Bose, who's not by any means a conservative, but who, who actually had imbibed some of the spiritual traditions that had, been appeal, that had appealed to him considerably. Now, he saw the charkha as something absurd, the transformation of a medieval absurdity into a modern panacea, as he called it. Tagore, who was greatly, uh, who was attracted to the ethical values which Gandhi stood for, and who actually gave him the title Mahatma, was distraught when the non-cooperation movement of 1921 started. And he expressed fears that Gandhi had unleashed atavistic passions and sacrificed reason and culture at the altar of some mantra, some unreasoned creed. It's a very evocative sort of horror story which he paints at that time of the unseen force which is weighing down and oppressing India. Some imagine some inspired uh, award attorney can use that in to today's context. Jinnah, who actually is a little, little different. Jinnah, the constitutionalist, and remember Jinnah had, at that time was still there, wearing the avatar of the constitutionalist lawyer of Bombay. And he just couldn't understand this explosive mix of religion, mob violence, everything which would take India into fearful dimensions. Again, the fear of the mob. So India's crypto-conservatives, as I argued in my previous lecture, had sought to construct a reinvigorated India on the strength of an imagery that, while being Hindu, almost ignored a place for Muslims and other non-Indic religions. Gandhi sought to overcome this problem with a sort of a multi-faith patriotism, something like these multi-faith uh, conglomerations, uh, you know, carnivals we often see in various parts of the world. And take, for instance, his description of the Ali brothers, who were the leaders of the Khilafat movement at that time, Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali. And he said, the brave Ali brothers are staunch lovers of their country, but they're Muslims first and everything else afterwards. It must be so with every religiously minded person. So for Gandhi, the search for God and culture was separate. He saw search for God as something virtuous and something worth, but he completely detached the cultural dimensions which the earlier generation of conservatives had put forward as being central, religion and culture being almost together, faith and culture being together. Gandhi detached it, at least tried to find a working way to cope with the problem which the others had not addressed. Unfortunately, the experiment resulted, ended in complete disaster. It collapsed after 1922, the faiths, instead of coming together, there was a wave of communal riots which broke out from 1924 and with sort of occasional breaks, continued right on till 1947. And overall, the movement for freedom after 1922, viewed purely in terms of participation, was essentially Hindu, with a sprinkling of some Muslims who took part. Maulana Azad is one example. Abdul Ghaffar Khan in the frontier province was another example. As a community, 
The Muslims kept their distance from both Congress and Gandhi. Now, the failure to draw in Muslims didn't result in the nationalist leadership embracing Hindu nationalism. The Congress didn't deviate from its avowed commitment to unitary nationalism. The real change was really at the grassroots. And here we find that this detachment of the communities had a considerable effect. In the provinces, in the localities, there was very little to distinguish a Hindu nationalist, a member of the Hindu Mahasabha, from that of the Congress. There have been enough historical studies done on it in the case of Bengal, in the case of Punjab, recently in the case of uh, the United Provinces, which show the great degree of overlap, that the identity of the Congress, as perceived in the districts, was really not very different from those who proclaimed Hindu nationalism. So there was no real schism. Those who were suspicious of Gandhi's mass mobilization went into other spheres. They went into the Liberal Party of Jayakar and Tejbaz Sapru and the Unionists of uh, Sir Chotu Ram and Sikandar Hayat Khan in Punjab. But in the localities, the earlier tendency of looking at Hindu nationalism the Hindu version of conservatism, if you might call it, and the Congress, there was a considerable overlap, which didn't, however, necessarily stretch to the uppermost layers of the party. Now, Savarkar, who I should have mentioned yesterday, but I didn't, may have been an influential thinker. But after the 1930s, when he sought to organize the Hindu Mahasabha, as a separate force in opposition to the Congress. Earlier, the Hindu Mahasabha and the Congress, more or less, they held their sessions more or less at the same city, more at the same time. Mother Mohan Malviya often was the president of the Congress. He later became president of the Hindu Mahasabha. So that, that, that overlap would have been there. Savarkar tried to create a separate body called the Hindu Mahasabha. He was a political Hindu. He was an atheist. And he posited himself against Gandhi, who was devoutly religious. It was a no contest. I mean, Gandhi won, hands down. Savarkar didn't even register in the blip of popularity, in, in the popularity charts. Everything about Gandhi struck them as far more indigenous, despite Savarkar's own record, etc. Savarkar only had a following largely among Maharashtrian Brahmins, particularly those who admired his phenomenally lucid command over Marathi. So Gandhi really accorded no political space to a rival body of Hindu conservatives. To be fair, Jawaharlal Nehru recognized this amorphous nature of the Congress which he inherited from Gandhi after independence. But he also lived in both denial and hope. For example, in late 1946, with independence just around the corner, he told a friend journalist with a degree of touching certitude that there are three things I want you to remember. One, India will never be a dominion. Two, there will never be a Pakistan. Three, when the British go, there will be no more communal trouble in India. Now, he was wrong on at least two counts. His writings immediately after partition are full of agonized references to the RSS mentality which had taken over the Congress, which had infected it, and the dangers posed by Hindu right-wing communalism, his words, which he said was explicitly fascist. They've taken their training from the Nazis, he believed. Now, Nehru had one single-minded project in his mind. He aimed at creating a secular state in a religious country. 
the very words which he used in an interview to Andrew Mulroe sometime in the 1950s, late 50s. His colleagues in the Congress who rallied behind people such as Sadar Patel, Rajendra Prasad, Raja Gopalachari, K. Munshi, and regional leaders such as Purushottam Das Standen, D.P. Mishra, Dr. B.C. Roy, they didn't want a Hindu republic. So it's a false juxtaposition to suggest that Nehru stood for secularism, these others stood for a Hindu republic. I think Gopal, in his extremely sympathetic biography of Nehru, got it right when he suggested that the old stalwarts of the Congress, such as Patel, Rajendra Prasad, with the backing of the Hindu Mahasava leader, Shama Prasad Mukherjee, believed not so much in a theocratic state as in a state which symbolized the interests of the Hindu majority. So it's the cultural tilt of the state which was important, not the constitutional provision. On the issue of the constitutional provision, there was a great deal of commonality and convergence between the two, that there can be no discrimination on the strength of religion, that India cannot have a state religion. India was not going to make itself a variant of Pakistan. I think on that count, there was complete unanimity. It really boiled down to how you project the state. What are the symbols of state? What, are the, what is the public culture going to be? These were not constitutional debates. These were political debates. Now, I think this comes out best in a speech of Sardar Patel, which he gave 13 days after independence in the Constituent Assembly. It's a slightly longish thing. I, I want to read it because I think it's very, very revealing in terms of the rhetoric which was used by the nationalist leadership immediately after independence. And if you contrast it to the rhetoric, uh, to the type of language which Nehru used. Now, Sardar Patel was responding to a debate on, I think it was a debate which Chaudhary Khaliku Zaman, who went over to Pakistan between the time that he moved the motion and the motion got discussed, uh, on the question of retaining of the separate electorates for Muslims. And Patel said, I once more appeal to you to forget the past. You have got what you wanted. Now, he's addressing the Muslim members directly. You have got a separate state. And, re and remember, you are the people responsible for it, not those who remain in Pakistan. What, what is it that you want now? I don't understand. In the majority Hindu provinces, you, the minorities, you led the agitation. You got the partition. And now again, you tell me and ask me to say, for the purpose of securing the affection of the younger brother, that I must agree to the same thing again, to divide the country again in the divided part. For God's sake, understand that we also have got some sense. There will be generosity towards you, but there must be reciprocity. If it is absent, then you can take it from me that no soft words can conceal what is behind your words. Therefore, I plainly once more appeal to you strongly that let us forget and let us be one nation. Now, a very abrasive speech, very pugnacious, combative speech, which gives no quarters. Contra I mean, to be fair, Nehru, in his speech to the Aligarh Muslim University a year later, did raise some of these questions of the common inheritance and why Muslims have shunned it. But he phrased it, not in a combative way. He phrased it very, very differently. But Patel's abrasiveness wasn't by any means unique under the circumstances, in, in the context of those times. Even in Nehru's lifetime, in state after state, which is all dominated by Congress governments, agenda which basically reflected the aspirations of Hindu conservatives were passed. Almost 18 or 20 states passed lay legislation prohibiting cow slaughter. In fact, most of the cow slaughter lay legislation which exists actually belongs to the days when the Congress was in power. 
There were restrictions on religious conversions, not aimed at Muslims, I may add, mainly aimed at Christian missionaries. Again, particularly in Madhya Pradesh, Odisha. The Sanskritization, used not in the Srinivas way, but the Sanskritization of Hindi, which followed, was also something which happened, which incidentally is something which is welcomed by the non-Hindi speaking states, because they understand it far better than they understand the more colloquial Hindustani of Northern India, something which uh, people in Delhi often forget. <laughs> So Nehru was definitely in the minority in the Congress when he sought to placate the Muslim minority with assurances of continuing with their separate personal laws, even as he sought to reform the laws governing Hindu laws of marriage and inheritance. Now, why was this? What was the thinking behind this approach? which has subsequently been demonized as Muslim appeasement. Gopal, again, has a very revealing comment to make about Nehru's mind, the way he was thinking. And he says that for Nehru, the problem of minorities was basically one for the majority community to handle. The test of success was not what the Hindus thought but how Muslims and other communities felt. Now, to my mind, that is at the heart of this, which is the, basically the schism between what can be called the Nehruvians and the others. Now, an echo of this, strangely enough, I found in uh, a speech by Dr. Manmohan Singh in December uh, 2006 at a conference of chief ministers when he said that minorities, particularly the Muslim minority, must have the first claim on the resources of India. A, a speech which led to, to a, a, had a very sharp reaction in, in the country. Now, to some extent, these attitudes of Nehru were grounded in electoral expediency. There was the leo of the end bloc Muslim support. The people who till 19, the election of 1946, albeit with a restricted franchise, had voted en masse all over the country for the League, for the Muslim League, now came as a ready-made constituency for the Congress. In fact, in the old days, when you went out to the constituencies, it was always told that the Congress starts the election with about 35% votes already in the bag. The others start from zero. So it was this Leo you know, of actually appealing to that constituency, ready made, which was probably recognized, may have played a role, I cannot say, but certainly it did play a role in, in the um, in, in the calculations of some of the others. So the idea that Nehru was, necess I, I, was necessarily anti-Hindu is, however, to my mind, problematic. I mean, Rajaji, Raja Gopalachari, who used to be his colleague and then later went over to form the Swatantra Party, of course, disagreed. His main critique of Nehru, apart from the fact that Nehru had strangled private enterprise, was that, the, as, as he wrote, the loosening of the religious impulse is the worst of the disservices rendered by the Congress to the nation. And Rajaji was the, one of the very, very few politicians in India who described himself as a conservative. His self-image was that of a conservative. And a conservative, not necessarily one who adhered only to the economic doctrines of the free market or supported the United States in the Cold War. Which was, for him, it was an ethical construct. It was based on his reading of culture, his reading of religion, and why it must have a central role in, in, in the Indian people. Now, Nehru's attitudes 
particularly his belief that it's really the onus is on the majority community to deal with all these problems, was, to my mind, partially because he believed that modernity was principally economic and technology oriented. That was the important thing for him. To, to him, it meant a very sharp break from moribund traditions and particularly historical memory. When he invoked the notions of the temples of modern India, he deliberately used temples in a different sense from what people were using it. For him, it was not the temples, it became the dams. It became the steel plants. But it was not entirely innocent. I think there was also a calculation. And I, and I want to cite particularly one speech of Nehru's, which was at the inauguration of the Punjab High Court in Chandigarh. And a Chandigarh is a city which, as Sunil has written quite evocatively, was something of a Nehru's personal passion. He chose an architect who perhaps is not, wasn't, whose qualities weren't sufficiently admired, whose avant-garde tendencies weren't sufficiently admired in Europe, not least because he had some dealings with the Vichy regime. But anyway, whatever it is, Chandigarh, the architecture, the imagery of Chandigarh was very much Nehru's personal thing. And it, during inaugurating that high court, he spoke. And this is a speech which, for, for inexplicable reasons, has really been buried. And I, it, it was just pure chance I discovered it. I am happy that the people of Punjab, he, wrote, he said, did not make the mistake of putting some old city as their new capital. It would have been a great mistake and foolishness. It is not merely a question of buildings. If you had chosen a, an old city as the capital, Punjab would have become a mentally stagnant, backward state. It may have made some progress with great effort, but it could not have taken a grand step forward. Implication, modernity means disavowal of the past. You have an arm's length distance between your present and your past. And the past is not something which should necessarily intrude onto your march into the, into the future. Where Nehru actually succeeded was in shifting the political agenda away from concerns of national identity and into the larger question of economic development. That was a striking political success. And one of the reasons why he succeeded was that the response of his critiques, or of his critics, was incoherent and backward looking. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, the non-left opposition focused principally on a few things. Number one, they demanded a national ban on cow slaughter. Number two, they demanded the primacy of Hindi, which alienated them from the whole of southern India and even parts of eastern India, and standing up for the rights of small traders. These seem to be the three things I could detect, which is the commonality, and this was their passion. Apart from very lofty rhetoric during the time of the 1962 China war. The Swatantra Party, too, on the other hand, did have an economic program centered on the promotion of free enterprise. They had a policy of opposition to any form of agricultural collectivization. And they, want, they question, incessantly questioned the pro-Soviet tilt in the foreign policy, particularly making a demon out of a rather repulsive gentleman, which Rudra has been studying, called Krishna Menon. <laughs> It was, but the Swatantra Party was hamstrung by the disproportionate influence of former princes and big business in its internal affairs. It's quite remarkable when you see this, actually the, the sort of, not the Politburo or whatever, the governing council of the Swatantra Party as it was constituted. 
The disproportionate number of Parsis from Bombay, all of them linked in some way or the other to, to the Tatars, the number of ICS officials, and a few odd bods here and there, and a lot of princes, flotsam and jetsam, including the rather glamorous uh, Gayatri Devi um, of Jaipur, who was an important member of the Swatantra Party. So the real breakthrough for the India's right didn't come under Nehru. And it may have been delayed for quite some time had it not been for a fortuitous development from their perspective, which was the split in the Congress. Now, by making personal loyalty to, to the leader, the hallmark of the Congress, Indira Gandhi, what she successfully did was she snapped the party's organic links in the grassroots. Almost the entire brigade of old-time congressmen who had been probably slightly skeptical of Nehru, but had given the Congress its diversity and its rootedness in the provinces, went away. Most of them went into political oblivion because the Congress, or who, as it was called, uh, didn't really fare well. And in fact, they dropped out of politics, leaving a space vacant. This was compounded further between 1969 and 77 uh, by the sharp left turn, the socialist turn of the Congress, which set in motion a state-sponsored bid to redefine India's public culture, including the writing of history. This is the first time it was done in a very conscious way at that time. The conservatives, who had happily prospered under the Congress, because it was such a broad church umbrella party, now started exploring possible new futures. And it happened so that immediately after this followed the draconian emergency. And one of the features of the emergency was the 42nd Amendment, which for the first time put the words socialism and secularism into the directive principles. It wasn't there today. So in other words, the codification of secularism, rather than it became, rather than a nebulous concept, became a preoccupation with a lot of people, including political parties. What do you mean? Is this real secularism? Is this pseudo-secularism? Etc. Etc. Prior to that, it was just assumed India is secular. How it's secular? Sometimes it's very secular. Sometimes it's you know nominally secular. It's Hindu secular, etc. Now, one of the shortcomings of India's non-Congress conservatives lay in their ability to attract mass support. Although, if you add in the conservative vote of those uh, parties, which can be called conservatives. This included a very interesting party at one time in the 52 election called the Ram Ranji Parishad. Now, one of the, it, 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 it's a quirky party uh, which had as its uh, leader one Swami Katpatri Maharaj and also had the support of the Shankaracharya of Puri. Its main preoccupation was the ban on cow slaughter. But, uh, among the pieces of progressive legislation, or progressive as they imagined, uh, their only intrusion into modernity lay in the fact that they wanted reserved jobs for all scavenger posts for the scheduled castes. A stereotyping of a variety which I think is quite horrific. But there it is. You had the, the, the type of loonies who actually occupied that. And, but despite all this, I think it's important to recognize that about 25% of the vote, if you add in various splinter parties, etc., Swatantra, Janasang, Ganatantra Parishad, Ram Rajapit, Akali Dal, etc., the right, loosely speaking, had about 25% of the vote, always. It was a pretty stable 25% which they had. But Individually, none of them could actually make effect any breakthrough. None of them had ever formed state governments. 
Now, this changed with one particular thing, the, Ram, the Ayodhya Ram Janmabhoomi movement. Now, why a local dispute dating back to 1528 captured the public imagination after a 1987 still, to my mind, awaits a credible explanation from the scholars. But there is absolutely no doubt that it touched a fierce chord in Indian society. Anybody who tries to deny that is really being willfully myopic. It had a tremendous response. Now, was it helped by the sort of Islamic assertion which took place in following Iran in 1980? Who knows? Was it a response to the massive mosque reconstruction program which the Saudi government had started off and had led to some of the conversions in Minakshipuram possibilities? Was it an unintended consequence of the spectacular popularity, the explosion of religiosity which followed the telecast of a serial called the Ramayan on Doordarshan? And again, the popularity of that serial was just amazing astonishing all over India. And it happened around that time. Or was it a reaction to Sikh militancy in Punjab, the expulsion of the Kashmiri Pandits from the valley, from the Kashmir Valley? All these are possibilities. I cannot really define. But it's probably they all help to create an environment in which, for the first time, after, I mean, not since, not since Independent, ever since independence for the first time, it, Ram Janmabhoomi became the coming of age party for Hindu nationalism. But it was not the same Hindu conservatism which, took, which had been inspired in the 19th century or even various parts of the earlier 20th century. Or the manifestations of this were different. This was a radical movement. This was a very, very different movement. First, it tried to break away from localized community-based support, which was a feature, the, the wisdom of the community, as uh, Susanil pointed out in a summary of what I had said earlier. It tried to create a national Hindu consciousness which overrode the particularities of region. This had been a project which had been tried many times before, but it never succeeded. It cut across caste. Conservatism had traditionally belonged to either a section of the Brahminical community or the trading community. It expanded exponentially to touch various features of what was called the backward castes and even the Dalitvot. And this was a very self-conscious move. It was not something that happened accidentally. The tribal communities, the Adivasi communities, for instance, were very influenced because they're all worshippers of Hanuman, who they see as their own distinct god. And I recall uh, during Advani's famous journey of going through patches of tribal districts of Rajasthan, and it was amazing, astonishing how late at night you actually came across villages where all the, you know, 30 women of the village and village of about 200 people coming out with thalis and garlanding him. It's not a spectacle you see normally in any, it's those small meetings which tell you far more about how a movement is being received than these large, huge-scale movements. Secondly, the Ram Janmabhoomi movement, while it incorporated historical victimhood, was also a very brash assertion of political Hinduness. You know, the slogan, Garf se kaho hum Hindu hai, say it with pride that we are Hindus. So Savarkar, what he had tried to do earlier had been to take the religion out of Hindu and transform it into an element of nationality. 
Savarkar was a political Hindu. He had said so quite explicitly. His Hindutva had nothing to do with religion. Anybody who thinks so, I'm misreading it. It was, as he put it, the national consciousness of the Hindus. So once again, here we see, and when Advani said, this is not a religious movement, this is a political movement, it was immediately resonant of what Savarkar had been trying for so long. Never got any traction. Quite unwittingly, you had the same ideas returning to the state. A very radical idea, which had actually been rejected by most of the conservatives in India at that point when Savarkar in the 1920s had talked about it. Which is why even the RSS would never talk about the political nationalism, or the political Hindutva of Savarkar. They were always talking about cultural nationalism. The very sharp differences which there. And this got linked to electoral politics. Electoral politics in such a way that prior to what those Sheila Pujans, as they were called, uh, the, uh, you know, two and a half, 250,000 consecrated bricks from different villages were sent to Ayodhya. So you can understand the scale of the mobilization. And BJP prior to that had never even won a single state election as the BJP. After that begins the process where one by one, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, they were not even the biggest non-Congress party in Gujarat. They were not even the biggest non-Congress party in Rajasthan. So from there, you see the beginnings, including the entry into southern India via Karnataka. And in Karnataka, it was the seeds of the BJP's growth are directly linked to the Ram Janakum. Now, the, the, how this movement was received and viewed in different parts of the country, I don't think is necessarily uniform. And I think it awaits a, different, a, a, a study to actually tell us how different states viewed it. Why did it become linked in Assam, for instance, with the entire question of illegal immigration from Bangladesh? Why did it get linked in Karnataka in a certain way? And today, Karnataka probably has the most, I would say, the most uh, militantly Hindu uh, groups who think that you know the BJP is communist. Uh, probably. Now, finally, the Ram Janmabhoomi, the Ayodhya movement, constituted the most sustained an even successful attempt to question the fundamentals of the Nehruvian consensus. It brought an entire generation of post-independence Indians into the realms of radical conservatism. And I use radical conservatism because it's very, very different from the one which had preceded it earlier. The intellectual ferment generated put the BJP at the center stage of Indian politics and established it as an alternative pole. So, what is very curious in this case is that the political breakthrough of conservatism actually takes place only when there is a detachment, a sharp rupture with the earlier traditions which had existed. There may be common strands, there are common strands indeed, but the driving force the principal focus was a radical. So when people talk about the radical Hindu right, they are not entirely incorrect. When they talk, when they refuse to use the word conservatism, they may be right in saying that, look, this is a very different movement. The question is, really, and which I'll talk about in my next lecture, is to what extent this radical impulses which the Ayodhya movement threw up translated and got carried into the BJP after they secured power both in the states as well as nationally. Thank you very much. Great. So we have a chance now to raise some questions uh, with Swapan. And um, 
really we'll go straight into them. What I might do is take two or three questions in a row uh, and stack them up and then hand them over to, 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 to respond to. So who would like to start with a question that they might have in mind, I, either from yesterday or from today's lectures? You should kick it off. Well, uh, let me then kick it off with, with I mean, the, the contrast you're making between, as you say, the, the, the political breakthrough that happens uh, involves a break with the earlier cultural conservative model. Where does that leave uh, a movement like the RSS, really, which is in some ways wedded to that earlier cultural nationalism? Where does it fit? With, with the political project underway? Uh, the one word answer is very confused. Um, I think there is, within the RSS, you have conflicting tendencies. You have, at the core of the RSS, a, a body of rather undistinguished full-time pracharaks, as they are called, who believe that the real work is the unglamorous task which happens of character building in the local shakas. As opposed to that, you are finding a load of new entrants into the RSS who believe that the RSS constitutes a convenient passport into politics. So it's the first point of entry. And that if you get into RSS, you will become part of the brotherhood and therefore you become a favored candidate for advancement into the league. So the, the larger philosophical questions, the larger political questions which this has thrown up, I have a feeling is completely unaddressed. And it really depends on who you're talking to within the RSS when you get different forms of answer. There will be, there is a critique. There are people who say, yes, we've strayed too far in the direction of the political. In conventional RSS thinking, as in most conventional conservative thinking, politics is not very important. Politics is never the most important feature of society. It's the other activities of civil society, those non-official, what you know, Orwell used to call the stamp collecting, the, uh, the gardening, and uh, maybe the Women's Institute, etc. That really forms the part of actual culture, the bedrock on which society is built. Now, these two conflicts, I think, are very apparent in the RSS. The RSS uh, chooses not to address them because there is also the question that today, the BJP, far from being the creation of the RSS, the appendage, has overtaken the RSS. So RSS has become really subordinate in terms of the BJP, which is why it sometimes flexes its muscles also to show, look, you know, we are the controlling interest. Not very successfully, but it, it does it. So there is that issue. Great. Well, let me open it up again to the floor. Who, who would like to raise a question? Yes, uh, if you could just introduce yourself and any affiliation that might be relevant. Excuse me, what, do we need a microphone to, to pick it up or are we all right? My name is Shom, I'm an uh, independent instructor. And uh, my question was about the radical departure. I think say that uh, it is a political representative by the BJP. Is, uh, for example, if we see the problems of the very reserved party. The Congress, you do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And also, set the character as one of the, for example, fundamental duty that is of the Constitution and the Army by the one second amendment has fundamentally to do with the character of the agencies and if it can do it, etc., etc. And I think Amitabh most sort of said that this government is like on steroids, it's Congress on steroids, essentially. So rather than a radical departure, uh, I want to respond to this. This form of conservatism always existed in the Indian polity and now only taking on a far more aggressive or a speedier approach to implementing that there. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> as a matter of correction, the term scientific temper was introduced right in the 1950 constitution, partly as an antidote to the fact that 
the ban, uh, one of the directive principles of the, of the Constitution also included a ban on cow slaughter. Uh, it also included prohibition. No, no, no. On economic grounds. Yeah, on, uh, we, know, we know exactly the code, uh, the code words for it. No, no, no. The fundamental duties don't exist anymore. It, don't, it doesn't exist. Yeah, it doesn't exist because the 42nd Const Amendment to the Constitution was thrown out. I don't think there is something called the fundamental duties. Maybe I do, as far as I don't know. Do you, I don't think there is anything called the fundamental duties, which ex uh, I'm sorry, but uh, but uh, I, I'm not sort of uh, getting into that. Uh, by and large, I think what the emergency under during Indira Gandhi's time were very exceptional circumstances, and I think she wanted to redefine the constitution in ways which were un inconceivable, had not yet been discussed within society at large, and uh, ultimately paved the way, perhaps, and here I might be a bit conspiratorial, for a presidential form of government, which was actually being co considered very strongly. So under those circumstances, the, the right of that the belief that freedom had resulted in a sort of permissive explosion of ideas in Indian society was very much current. Today, I don't think the same things e exist. Firstly, it is quite clear that the state does not form a very important part of the government's cultural agenda. Where it has played a part is in terms of certain people wanting to get onto state bodies. To do what, they're not very sure. So the state creation of culture, the creation of duties, etc., had been very much a Congress thing. So Amitav can talk about, there are elements of it which Congress can be, like the BJP can be Congress on steroids. But I think the focus is uh, a little different. I mean, their priorities, the, where they come from are two different places. Yeah. Uh, first, the issue of the overseas Indians in uh, the uh, two things. First, there was a conscious attempt by the Vishwa Hindu Parishad (VHP), which is by the name Vishwa means global. They've always seen as all Hindus, whether they live in Fiji, they live in Mauritius, or Guyana, or India, as being part of the larger Hindu community. There were modest contributions here and there from there. And it probably touched a chord in unlikely places like Guyana, Trinidad, for, I'm sure, completely local reasons there. But overall, it's not very, very significant, although individuals may have played. As a collective body, neither in terms of resources nor in terms of manpower did the non-resident uh, individual. I think this is a bit of a you know, the point is that these people always encourage anyone who's interested to come. Very much a, a project which I've often seen in Israel also. Anybody who's remotely interested in Israel is always encouraged to come and participate in the homeland, etc. So the similar sort of uh, uh, approach exists there. Secondly, as far as the uh, Reagan and Thatcher thing is concerned, uh, moment is concerned, uh, I, w I, I was planning to dwell on it tomorrow when when talking about governance, but I'll give, give a brief answer to that. By and large, there has been the Indian right, with the solitary exception of the Swatantra Party, which never really took off, has never been terribly enamored of the free market. 
They've seen it more as an instrument of expediency where necessary, rather than a, something of commitment. For Thatcher, I mean, Hayek was the Bible. I mean, she was committed to it. Ideologically, intellectually, everything committed to it. And the people around her were also committed to it. I don't think you get a situation like that in the Indian right. There is a small group of people uh, of late who've emerged, who want to. Uh, there's a Liberty Institute in Delhi. There's a Swarajya magazine, uh, which was uh, which Rajaji's thing, which has been revived. There are these small initiatives which uh, are there, but I don't think the economic right. Uh, 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 Sadanand Dhume organized a lovely uh, dinner table uh, sort of seminar uh, on this question. And whether really the only economic right person was really Surjit Bhalla and um, uh, what, what Das is? Gurcharan Das. Gurcharan Das. And you, you don't find them very much. At least they're not terribly. In fact, a lot of the economic right was also present in Manmohan Singh's. Uh, ecosystem, not necessarily the Congress ecosystem, but Manmohan Singh's ecosystem. So it's it's not a defining feature. I'll take a couple of questions together. Yeah. Oh, the RSS, the RSS. RSS. <laughs> it's an issue which has often been debated, which people, particularly columnists, have suggested that they should uh, break off their ties. Uh, there are large problems in this. There's a great deal of overlap. There are RSS goes into areas where political parties don't go into. That is probably the less glamorous, but really probably the most valuable work. The entire inroads which the BJP today is the beneficiary of in tribal Adivasi dominated constituencies is almost entirely the work of the RSS. The RSS provides on some elections, not all elections, a huge army of unpaid, dedicated volunteers, which no other political party has. And this is something which is very, very important. If you actually go and witness an election at a constituency level, you'll see how important it is to have that unpaid people. I mean, unpaid meaning they get a lunchbox, probably, or, or something like that. But basically, they're not given money as opposed to others who have to depend on paid people. So that's a huge asset, the penetration which they take into account. So for the moment, what I think the project, which a lot of people in the BJP, not least Mr. Modi, wants to do, is to say, RSS, do your thing. Governance, let me do my thing. Now, in an ideal world, that would be the thing. How it will actually translate always has. So there's a lot of road bumps you have to negotiate along the way. To get to the question of the Varna system, I'm not terribly sure whether the, uh, the, the role of Varna, as you put it, uh, is, is that profound in terms of political articulation. I mean, it's, it reminds me of a time <coughs> when I had described the sociologist Andre Bette as a conservative in one of my writings, and, and I meant it in terms of his respect for certain institutions. 
And Andre protested quite vigorously to me. And he said, in India, a conservative is not one who has respect for institutions. In India, conservatism means someone who's attached to kinship ties. More or less, that goes in line with what you are suggesting. Look, there is always a political dimension of caste. Caste is intensely political today, particularly in parts of northern and southern India. Elections are fought. The agency of mobilization is often the caste, not always. I mean, there are elections where it's, caste becomes less important. For instance, in this Bihar election, caste was very important. So the, it asserts itself more in rural communities. It asserts itself less in urban communities. One of the real features, and if I might take it to another plane, which differentiated Gandhi and Ambedkar, for example. Gandhi celebrated the village community. Ambedkar saw it as an instrument of oppression. He said its villages where the worst form of caste discrimination and oppression is practiced. So the dissolution of the village community for him was something worthwhile and urban, more urbanization of India was something to be looked at. So this is, uh, I think, rather than see it in terms of a combative uh, uh, student union type position, uh, I think let's recognize it as something of an interesting phenomena which has various dimensions. How many days did you raise it? Since you raised it, I also. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask you to ask you to ask you to ask If you could speak up a bit, because we don't have mics and we want the questions to be picked up. Which, which one are you referring to? Come to my earlier talk, I'd say that uh, I would have said you would have realized that what defines an Indian conservative as it defines conservatives elsewhere in the world, and it's by no means a uniquely Indian phenomena, is the belief, and this is that collective wisdom of the community is always takes precedence over individual choice. Now, that forms the bedrock of conservative beliefs that wisdom really lies in the species, not in the individual. From there, you can deduce a lot of conclusions from there. That's the larger sense in which how individual freedoms are viewed in, through the lens of political class. But there is also the legalistic attitude. There is, in, by law, certain rights which are accorded to individuals in society. And those rights obviously take precedence. So it depends what you're looking at. If you're looking at it through the prism of law, you get one sort of set of answers. If you're looking at it through the prism of political philosophy, political mobilization, you're likely to get another, where the individual does not become preeminent. It becomes a secondary position. Now, as far as the second question is concerned, uh, you know, the issue of cultural freedom is an interesting one. And I think what we are witnessing in India, and here I'm being a bit of a contrarian, is 
not the suppression of individual rights, although that too happens and has happened all the, uh, constantly. But we are witnessing a larger phenomena, which we are witnessing a form of culture war, where a certain entrenched position is often being challenged by others who may not have the same degree of articulation, may not have had the same degree of exposure. So it's a bit raw. And I believe that this is part and parcel of a democracy, this contest of ideas, which is ongoing, and no one has a monopoly of it. So far from truncating the democratic space, I think what it has shown is that there is a pretty vibrant democratic culture which exists in India more than anything else. Rather, and it's, I don't think it shows the shortcoming. I think it does reveal certain people's political preferences, which is legitimate in itself. But to make a larger societal type constitutional comment on the state of Indian democracy, I think maybe extending the argument a bit too far. Take two more because we're actually coming up to time, but I know we did start a bit late. So, um, Frankly, Professor Dwyer, I lack some of the expertise to be able to answer all that question with the sort of depth of your question. But all I can say is that some of the problems which we've witnessed recently, not least of which is the FTII issue, the rather silly sense, uh, cuts which have been made in the Bond film, are all function of inappropriate people put in certain places. It's really a flawed positioning of individuals rather than a systemic one. In India, in the past also, I think today Sharmila Tagore, who is the more, uh, the, pre the previous thing of the censor board, also spoke about how in an earlier film she had to use she had to delete certain scenes because he said, she said, look, it's going out to people who are very much more impressionable than you imagine. And so there is a sort of a lowest common denominator we have to cater to. I think if you looked at the... Uh, no, no, I'm not... Uh, <laughs> uh, the, for, for example, when this issue of this rather brutal rape of uh, the... Uh, girl, Nirbhaya rape, as it was, happened. Among the concerns which were raised is, and I don't think satisfactorily answered, but the questions have been raised, to what extent does this sort of aggression stem from depictions in Bollywood films? You'll be the better person to be able to answer that satisfactorily. But certainly, we've seen in Bollywood mind, uh, mindless violence. We've also seen Jai Santoshima, which is one of your favorite films, I'm told. Uh, we've seen sort of uh, devotionalism, family values, truancy, and plain simple love stories of the, uh, you know, the poor, poor boy meets the rich girl sort of variety. So you get all forms. Now, whether 
these should actually be actively channeled into some cultural form in a self-conscious way is, I certainly believe, does not fall under the prerogative of the state. But if others are, Chalchitra academies are set up elsewhere, as it is, the most of these FTII and all these things state-sponsored are by and large dominated by the left. And the public culture can do with a little bit of more variety. We'll take one more question, not because I want to stop the questioning, but because we we'll carry those over to tomorrow, and I think we can't run too much past 6.30, but... Oh, okay. You should... Oh, okay, well then, you, we'll take your question then. Uh, we'll be minding the answer to our post-grade for the institute. I have one question to you, sir. Uh, what do you think if there is an unpunctual by the liberal sections, like if, as a by itself, or if it's put to the manifestation? I would read Jewel in the Crown, Paul Scott's book. Oh, it's, it's a very useful book to read because it's a wonderful depiction of the last years of uh, British India. He's one of the best. He, he documents it so well. And he says, there's a particular section there about talking about Hindu Mahasabha. I, I, I might actually have it here. <laughs> Not the book, the particular. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. Now I'll just read it out to you. Yeah. He writes, Hindu meant Hindu Mahasabha, Hindu nationalism, Hindu narrowness. It meant rich baniyas with little education, landowners who spoke worse English than the younger subdivisional officer, his eager but halting Hindi. It meant, it, it meant sitting without shoes with your feet curled up on the chair, eating only horrible vegetarian dishes and drinking disgusting fruit juice. Now, to my mind, that may have been written in the context of the 1940s. But translate that, and you get what is the, I might say, the English-speaking stereotype of the person who falls under the notion of the conservative, the stupid party, as I mentioned yesterday. That is the stereotype. It's, it's something which exists purely, only, and in a very magnified sort of way in India. Because certain assumptions on which conservatives base their thinking, community, family, are being questioned by certain more avant-garde tendencies. And the inclination of those who are in media, who are in other positions in academia, tend to undermine their importance in terms, or at least cer certainly don't attach the same degree of value, uh, attach the same degree of value to those concerns. So that, to my mind, plays this stereotyping. And we all complain about stereotyping, everybody in their own little way. But I think the Indian conservative has a right to s complain quite bitterly about the type of stereotyping which has been done, about seeing them as people with tilaks and saffron scarves who uh, are completely untutored in the ways of the world. I, maybe there are some, but I'm sure there are uh, leftists who are stoned out of their heads most of the time, or drunk. <laughs> Well, on that note, we can all go off in search of leftists stone out of their head or, or tilak wearing uh, people on the strand. Um, once again, a, a very rich and thoughtful set of, and deeply felt lecture, I thought, this evening as well. Uh, tomorrow is the third and final in the series, uh, and that will be back in the River Room. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. So it's actually going to be in the same room here, um, and it's on uh, conser Indian conservatism and the compulsions of political power. There will also be questions after tomorrow's lecture, so I hope those of you who haven't had a chance to ask today will be back tomorrow. And can you join me once again in thanking Swapandas Gupta for a wonderful round.